right, last talk of the day. We got uh, Justin Herman. He's going to talk about quick wins to the defense. Thanks so much. I want to thank all of you guys for coming down. Uh, I know the last talk of the day is sometimes difficult to get that energy and push through, but I promise you that uh, if we get through this, we can all uh, head to the bar and have a good time. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I am Justin. Uh, I'm an organizer of uh, the B-Sides Cleveland. I'm also um, one of the board members of Northeast Ohio Information Security Forum, also my Cleveland Locksport. Previously, I've been a sysadmin, a network engineer, a sysadministrator, help desk, a lot of red side, sorry, blue side, and I'm currently working as a red teamer um, with a large bank and um, very much of a hobbyist. Um, this whole talk includes a lot of um, GIFs and memes of Ron Swanson, so hopefully you all enjoy it to kind of break up the monotony. So what this talk is really focused to, who it's not really intended to go to, is um, a blue teamers, the people with limited resources. Uh, you're in a company that uh, doesn't have a lot of maturity, maybe their security model, and uh, you have willingness to learn, though, and a desire to make something better for tomorrow. Uh, obviously, all of you guys have come to conference and not only come to the uh, a blue team talk, so you all usually fit into a lot of those categories. I know that when I was in the position of a small infant organization and I didn't have a lot of resources or money or time, I felt a lot more like Sisyphus here than Hercules. Um, every day going in, feeling like you get one step forward or two steps forward and then three steps back, constantly pushing the rock up the hill. But this talk is focused on ways that I found and the methods that I used in order to step myself um, from just that person in the corner who runs uh, a little bit of the uh, network or the servers to a trusted resource for management and making those big, the small wins um, real fast and bring them to market. So the first question is, how do we win fast? And if you're in the military, you're in paramilitary, you'll hear a lot, uh, smooth is fast. But fast may not, may not always be smooth. And that uh, real concept is that you need to practice and rep create repetition to the functions that you do and all have an organized method that you're going to handle certain issues. And as you work out that process, it comes second nature, it becomes your common language, and you start to adopt it in all aspects of um, the way you carry yourself. So where we start is uh, the particular domains. And in my, my mind and where we started it was I wanted to deal with myself first. The first thing that I can handle and control is, of course, myself. The next is my domain, um, the, the, my, my actual craft, whether that be the network side or endpoint control or server administration or anything other aspects of those particular domains. Next is my department of an IT team, uh, whether that be the blue side and red side, if there was some personnel there, or management tying them in um, to my complete department, my company, and then my community as a whole. And I want to work through each one. I'm going to talk about ideas and concepts that we can kind of bring to market and bring to bear that we can uh, improve upon. So first, starting with, of course, the thing you have most control over, which is yourself. You need to be able to create processes. Uh, and those processes need to be written. And you need to be able to follow those processes throughout. And you're going to continue working on those. You're going to automate the crap out of everything. And uh, that's a key thing that you're going to be able to make good wins, is by learning and accepting um, that you need to automate and create and work through those processes. You constantly need to be able to learn and you need to apply those lessons and rinse and repeat, um, carrying it back forward with creating processes and, uh, and, and moving through there. If you're willing to do that to yourself and start looking at different ways that you can apply those particular steps, you're going to find that you have success and you're going to find that you are able to move, that hill, move up that hill a little bit faster, move that rock up and feel a lot more secure in your environment. So in written processes, you need a document. I know everybody hates it. Everybody hates to document. It doesn't come as second nature to a lot of us. Um, but you do need to start to do it. And you just need to document what you do and what you know. Um, we have a, a saying, my organization currently, is that you might get hit by the lottery bus. And if you were to take a sudden windfall or get injured or 
just decide to walk out, you need to be able to have some sort of idea that you could hand off to the person they could pick back up and know exactly what you were intending to do in the future, what are your upcoming concerns, how you perform the actions that you perform on a day-to-day -day process and basis. I encourage everybody to keep a pen and paper with you at all times. Um, I don't know if you guys know about the field notes, but uh, everywhere I go, I always carry one, um, jot down ideas. and It may not always be uh, full complete sentences, but it's just something to always remind yourself. Um, I'm a big encouragement of, of sending confirmation emails. If I get a response, we spoke about something over a meeting or in person or even over the phone, I'll shoot an email back and say, hey, this is what we spoke about. Just want to confirm that we're all on the same page. We're going to go ahead and authorize the purchase of X, Y, and Z, or we're going to go ahead and um, I see you're going to take the day off, or what, whatever the case is. You need to become the note taker in the room. You need to be the person who is aware of your domain and uh, you know yourself, and you need you need to be able to be accountable to that. And of course, the ticketing system. I know in some organizations they're a little bit stronger on that. Once you um, in, on the entire IT department, they will have a great um, acceptance of the ticketing environment. And other ones, you know, that's what the help desk does. They write tickets. We don't need to worry about tickets. Even in the senior positions and when you're working with technology, you still need to write those tickets. Um, write down what you did. Write down your thoughts. Write down what your findings are. Because you're going to forget it. We work in such a fast-paced environment and the technology continually changes right past us that you know, you, something you might have learned or memorized or thought that you would know perfectly a month ago, and now you can't remember heads or tails of it. I know it happens to me, and I'm sure it happens to all of you. So working beyond ourself, and once we've, we've kind of worked on those ideas, we, we want to move on to our domain. We want to get our house in order. And so this is for, you know, our network admins and our server admins and endpoint admins and everyone else that's kind of that blue team side. And you don't have a lot of support in your environment. Your organization doesn't have a red team. It doesn't have a tiger team. It doesn't have budget for a sim. It doesn't have budget for anything that you go and you, you would wish for, for pie in the sky. But there's lots of things that you can do either on a very, very low budget um, with, you know, desktop, old desktop hardware that might be around with automation, with scripting, with functions that allow you to keep your environment secure with the limited amount of resources that you have available. So as a network administrator, you know, you want to be documenting out all of the ACLs and know exactly um, what each one is doing and why they were implemented and when do you intend to go back and recheck and, and reverse and uh, look at those purposes. Do they still hold? Should we still be maintaining all these particular rules? Or can we simplify them? Can we condense them down? Can we eliminate some because particular products are no longer on the market in our environment? You know, you need to understand about why particular VLANs are in place. I've walked into organizations when I worked for an MSSP and they couldn't tell you what these particular VLANs were doing. They couldn't tell you why the ACLs existed or, or why these rules were there. And there was no documentation anywhere. So instead, you're constantly looking around trying to think, well, if I remove this, I might break X, Y, and Z. And this is not, this environment of technology, we should not be like that. We need to be able to bring to bear the fact that we know what is happening and be able to communicate that with not only our teammates, ourselves, and also people in the future down the line. So as a network administrator, also knowing about your inventory, understanding version control and configuration management, all of these things are simple things that don't require a dollar's worth of cost for you to purchase a new product to be able to deal with that. These things can be done through automation of uh, pulling out configurations and running a batch script to pull that out through, through uh, SSH sessions or just Excel documents. And server administrators, you know, understanding your application stacks, what's required for different dependencies, the different particular user groups and why they exist, the lines of business that a particular application is using and, and what its purpose is in the organization is very important to be able to bring um, the concept that you, that you understand what you're delivering to the end users. And I mean, in, in endpoint administrators, and that comes back to the help part of the help desk if you're there, is understanding your inventory, how many machines are out there, uh, the, what applications are commonly used. You know, you may not have control to be able to lock down every aspect, every point of control that may be in place, but if you understand at least what should be whitelisted, you can then have an idea to move the ball forward in the future that if 
new program comes forward and you haven't heard of it before, well, then now you need to be able to research. You need to bring that to the rest of the team and um, kind of work from there. So I always encourage people to you know, identify the low-hanging fruit before you go and ask for budgets. Um, if you're able to get, to get those low-hanging fruit, solve those particular problems, eliminate a certain num- a particular a metric and reduce that, and that metric could be um, you know, by your own design. You, know, you could say number of infections, and I was able to reduce that by uh, only permitting certain applications to be ran or, or eliminating uh, local administrator access or um, you know, wh- whatever particular metric you want to leverage. If you're able to actually quantify that and then keep that and record it as a, as a win for yourself and maybe not even announce that to management just yet when you're coming to the table, but you're going to be bringing an understanding of where you were and where you are now and where you might want to go in the future. It's going to allow you to be able to show your impact and you can then be able to log that information. So one core thing that I think is an amazing tool that all of us can use that, you know, from the lowliest um, low person to all the way up to the senior and in, 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 in management is actually to be able to automate. Um, you know, you have the power, a lot of us, to run with PowerShell and Python, Bash, and Windows Bash. If you're into VB or you're into any other programming languages, it really doesn't matter. A lot of the actions that, that you perform repetitively through our, our day can be automated, and they should be automated. You need to take the time to address that. If you perform an action multiple times a week, you should be automating that because then it removes the problem, the possibility of creating error in your process. You are able to think about it systematically from start to finish what needs to be executed in case you haven't fully uh, flushed out that process because programmatically you're going to need to have that in place. And uh, you can really, you know, help yourself. So, so some ideas for automating, you know, that I would um, look into if, you know, kind of takeaways that you guys might be interested in is, you know, finding stale uh, AD uh, objects. Um, you want to be able to, you could easily run that through PowerShell, look for a get AD request and look for users that haven't logged in in a long period of time. They're ripe for disabling. Or computer objects that haven't checked into the domain in over, you know, six months. Should they really be in place? Should they be disabled? Um, you know, looking at uh, group memberships. Has someone joined the domain admins? Has some, someone joined the local admins group? Has someone joined the help desk group and that haven't had a new employee join the company? If that's the case, you should be throwing off red flags. You know, if maybe that's not even to a full send. Maybe that's just to an email. Your email address comes back. And it sends you alerts that says, hey, there's a new group membership. These, there, are, there are sample scripts that are available out there, and I've got a few in my GitHub repository. But you know, it's very simple, a few lines of PowerShell, and you can be able to have a lot of these problems uh, solved. You know, we're doing, uh, again, scripting out repetitive tasks. For network alert, men's is alerting, you know, service interruption or anomaly de- detection. You know, if you can see a huge spike on traffic, um, you know, you may not have a lot of tools to be able to dynamically control a lot of that environment, but you can at least get yourself an alert. You can at least make yourself aware. And if that aware, you being aware of it may not even be until the next day, you're still ahead of the game versus if you didn't have any alerting at all. Um, configuration backups, again, something very simple. A lot of organizations and mature organizations have that, but you know, immature organizations, they've just been running with, you know, they call on the IT person. They may get something working. Once they have it working, it's uh, A-OK, and they don't think about it ever again. They're not saving and, and sharing that the config uh, across the environment. Of course, endpoint admins comes back to configuration, automation, um, knowing what your, your environment should look like. You know, there's a lot of tools that are out there that are available to augment some of these uh, automation, and that includes, you know, local administrator, controls, uh, knowing what the, the local administrator password is. They're using ships or laps. One of them is uh, available on Microsoft Tech Net. One of The other one is from uh, TrustedSec. Uh, you can set up user password change reminders, um, helping the end user remind them that their password is going to be coming up due for expiration. We not, may not think of that as a security control, but as much as we can help the end users understand why we're bringing certain things to light and what's expected of them, 
You're going to have a lot less groans and moans that, oh, I didn't know that I had to change my password, and it's, it's locked out. And you could leverage that particular uh, concept as a metric and bring it to light to say, hey, you know, we were able to reduce the number of calls in the environment because we put this one little simple email that went out. Um, a crown granularity, you know, looking at uh, breaking apart your own account. You know, if you walked into an, uh, an immature environment, you may find everyone's a domain admin, or everyone's a local administrator, or everyone from the IT department is a domain admin, or schema admins, or enterprise admins, and none of them need to really be part of that. And even you as the, a top administrator of an environment don't need to be part of the schema admins unless you're making schema changes. You shouldn't be part of groups um, that you don't need to be, unless it's directly proportional for your job at the task that you're handling right then. So separating out your own account um, with a low privilege account that you maybe make your email with, uh, a next level account which, which would handle you know, um, server controls, next one up that might handle domain controls and maybe even break that out where you'd have an intermediate which would allow you a local administrator of certain machines. Um, there is the standard technical implementation guide that's available uh, that is um, used by the DOD. They have excellent concepts and ideas um, and gives you hints and, and ways that you can even roll certain GPO settings out that can seriously improve your, your configuration. Um, I wouldn't recommend rolling them all out all at once or <laughs> not testing them in an environment because some of them are, are fairly hard and um, can break some historical um, applications, um, cannot work from there. So, you know, immature organizations also commonly forget about, you know, having a WSUS or Windows update servers. They simply rely on the user's input to, to update machines. If you were to rule out a, a WSUS system, you're gonna, they're going to get faster updates and you could programmatically have it happen when, at night when they're not thinking about their, their updating process. Instead, it just continually works. And you've got a similar configuration between all of the machines. Um, log management, big, big concern. Um, I've stepped into many organizations, and they don't have any sort of controls that will permit you to, to store or record those uh, even AD logs. Um, and that's just system, um, you know, straight up system and, and, and configuration and uh, security logs. It's simple to set up a uh, gray log or a log stash environment, um, and that can be ran on, on basic hardware if you're just talking about a, a few dozen uh, domain controllers, if you're just talking about those particular logs. And even if you only stored them for a good 30 days and then chuck the old ones, it still gives you a look back period that you may not have had if you were at a, uh, you know, you weren't aggregating those particular logs together. Windows logs, Windows forwarding, uh, for you know, service logs are completely available and that is free and built into the Windows Server and you can ship those logs back to an independent Windows Server if you, if you so desire. Another thing is by aggregating all of those logs together and bringing it to a particular environment where you could look at it in a single pane, whether that be uh, Logstash or, or uh, Gravana or whatever, whatever flavor that you want, OSM, um, from there you can actually gain some insight. You could build alerts off of those. You see a lot of failed attempts. You now know you need to, you know, figure out why that's occurring and what endpoint that's that's happening from and why users, even the basics, why is the user's account getting locked out? What machine is it coming from? What part of the network? Um, you know, comes a lot of hand, handy to help end users out. Uh, I would highly recommend, if you don't have one already, is to have a, a change log email. Just create an email address box on your own system. And when you make a configuration change, just shoot an email to it. It's a great way that you can have a historical look back if you don't have a formalized change request environment set up and you're, you're kind of rolling this all on your own. You can send a quick message. It allows you to go be able to look back and say, okay, why did I, why did I up this system to have additional resources? Oh, and, and six months ago, I did do that. And now I say I've got to do it again three months from now, and, and again, another three months, you can see the growth rates that are occurring for a particular environment. Another thing that's really great with automation is uh, employee education. We have an amazing amount of technical skill that we carry with us and that the end users 
barely understand. You know, they understand how to get to their, their applications that they need to work with. They might understand how to hop on the web and, and see, you know, Facebook, YouTube, or whatever their social environment is. But we know a lot more on how to be safe and what you should be looking out for, even at your home or your banking. Um, a lot of organizations, they have a, a you know, way to send an email to all the users, or they have a, a mailing list, or they've got a, a newsletter. Offer to write a little article there. It doesn't take much. You can spend a little paragraph of a little, little keeping it safe and uh, you know, send that out and you're going to build trust. And when you start building trust, you're going to build influence. So the next portion you want to continue working on and, and I think developing and, and building wins is, is, is in your department. Uh, I think very often we get very siloed in our concepts. We, we only... Um, I only work on servers, so I don't really care about the networking team. Or I only work on servers, so I don't think about the endpoint. Or I'm only on endpoint, why do I care about the networking team? Or I'm only on this, I'm on telephony, I don't care about any of those other guys. We need to collaborate. We need to share ideas. We need to be able to bounce off ideas off of each other. In organizations that are smaller like this, that may not have a whole large team, you don't have a lot of resources. And there's a lot of experience in your own department, and you need to be able to share and uplift and support them. They may have security initiatives or concepts that they'd love to do, but they don't have the resources to do, or they need a little bit more oomph for, or a cheerleader to be behind. Be their cheerleader. Be on their team. Build friendship within your department. That you know, that just because uh, the networking team got an upgrade and got their purchase for whatever their fancy new um, project is, doesn't mean that your project is any less. It just means that the organization identified that as having a little bit more value at the moment. And the next step may be yours. But if you work together and, and are not trying to snipe at each other and thinking, well, he got, he got some, so I now need to have mine, or, or I, I didn't get it last time, or any aspect like that um, really just tears you and the rest of the team down. And that's not something you want to do. So I encourage you know, keeping a change log, sharing that change log out with other members so they kind of understand where you're com coming for. Uh, coming from send out a week department emails or, or weekly talks if you don't get a chance to. And that could be formalized or informal where you're just, you know, circled around and, and talking over the water cooler. The company is the next step that I would um, think you should work on. And, and that is uh, once you've talked, once you've assisted with these, these issues and you've kind of um, built a little bit of trust, you want to listen to where the other you know, departments in your organization and where they're having problems at. How does your business make money? What, is it, what does it do? What does Sally in accounting, what is her pain point? How could, how could you maybe help her in, in her issues? She, she has to do this manual task every time and she doesn't know anything about automation. She doesn't know anything about um, you know, creating templates. She, she just barely knows on how, that she needs to put these particular boxes and it needs to look like this before she ships that, ships that document out. We have a lot of skill and understanding of how technology works. We can leverage that and build trust with her and help the organization. And at the same time, do it in a um, secure manner, a manner that we can you know, stand behind and we, we feel safe on. And we can document that entire process. So you know, employee education is a strong one in building that trust, building that leverage. Um, but you know, workflow automation and, and document creation are, are very simple things to do with, with both uh, Python and, and PowerShell, and um, you can pull those out. You know, other people see uh, what we do as magic, and uh, you know that we're we're wizards. That you know, it just whenever we come by, it just fixes itself. It always works for us. And the case is that we've built up years of knowledge, and we can leverage that that altar that they're they're putting us on to build trust, that we're not aloof to them, that we, we want them to help. We want to be able to make sure the business can succeed. We also want to do it securely. And we want to be able to um, you know, have great technology that's available, but we need to do it at the proper rate that the organization can handle it. So listening and respecting and providing technical, techni technical solutions and help and educate are core things that need to be done in order for you to be able to succeed in your environment. They don't take much. You can, you can build, start building trust, you know, next week. 
You don't have to uh, have a, a, a formalized plan, or, but just be open and be willing to understand where people are coming from. Listen to them as human beings. We need to give back as a community uh, after we've kind of felt comfortable with all of those other portions of the organization. Um, you need to share solutions and resources that you found. And that doesn't mean that you need to share confidential information or applications that have been built on company time. I'm not suggesting anything like that. But there are aspects where you found a resource that was available out in the web. You could tweet it. Hey, I found this cool kind of article that no one else kind of mentioned. This might be helpful for someone else. Or write a vlog about it. Or extend a pod, put it on a podcast, or give talks, or you know, put a YouTube, um, or you know, the meetup groups. It, it doesn't really matter. As you share cool and interesting concepts, we need to be willing to step out of our boundary and say, "Hey, I learned something kind of new I, that I didn't know." And it's a bit scary when you start talking about standing up in front of your community and and sharing things because you believe that well, everybody else must know this. Everybody must, everyone else must know exactly how, how, to, how to program in Fortran or, or, or how to write VB code. I mean, this is, this is easy stuff. They should all probably know it. But the fact is that many of us don't have concepts and a lot of the technologies that you may have expert, ex, expert, expertise in. We need to be able to willing to share and humble ourselves and help others understand where we're kind of coming from. You know, no one, I've never heard a single person, um, come up and say, hey, I saw this cool thing, and then someone else feels, you know, slight them for it. And if I ever saw something like that, you'd, they would definitely get an earful, because that's not the community that we want to share. We want to share um, growth and, 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 um, and help. So as we're building these small wins and, and, and improving our environment and, and building, recording these metrics, we can start to leverage trust and influence. We've became um, more than just that guy who ch comes in and checks back out, um, stays in the corner, doesn't talk to anybody else. We instead turn into an ally, a person that you can, they can draw from in their organization. You can then use that influence to you know, make changes and make recommendations. Um, you're able to start moving mountains, things that you didn't think that would be able to be trusted, or systems in place that, oh, we've always done that in the past, we don't change anything. That's not, we've always done it this way. You can start trying to understand why that's the case and then proposing new options. And because you've built trust in smaller projects and, and, and coming up with solutions, you're actually able to make those uh, occur, uh, issues occur. So the great thing is once you get part of this influence and trust, you, you, you start getting questions like, like this. We, we, hey, we've got, you know, X number of dollars left over in a budget. What should we kind of spend it on? Or we want to give you time off to, to we want to give you some uh, extra staff to fix the issue quickly because we know you can do it, but we want you to get, be able to get back to what you, you really love to do. Or, you know, what training and conferences are you interested in this year? These are the exact same questions word for word that I've had, um, as I worked through this type of process and it, going from, uh, stage to stage in, in my uh, career, you start building trust and you build um, clout. In preparation for this talk, um, there was a, a great book that kind of got recommended to me and I, I felt it was kind of applicable and I wanted to use this, I guess, as a podium and speaking board to let, let you guys know about it and I would encourage everybody to kind of read it. It's a very short book. It's called The Go-Giver. And um, it speaks about five different uh, laws that are, are, are important to you to be able to have success. And I found it very applicable because, you know, they say the value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and reciprocity. And, uh, you know, working through each one of those gives you an ability to give back to other people, which in, you know, information technology or information security, we are here to give back. We're here to support the business. We're here to bring value. Um, you know, some people might find us as not being, we're just a, a cost center. We just suck money. All we say is no. But the point is that we should bring to them solutions that allow them to be able to work faster and easier and more securely. So, you know, in value, your, your true worth is determined by how much more you give than you take. Your compensation 
Your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. We have an amazing opportunity because we can touch almost everybody in the organization and serve them well. And if we're able to solve all, a lot of their problems, um, you know, we're going to have a, a lot more value and compensation. The influence, um, you have an amazing amount of influence because you control. We, most jobs today require technology, and if you're directly tied to that as an administrator, you have a direct influence to them, and you can make their lives easier. You can make it harder. You can make it so they have to change their password, you know, 40 times um, in a, in a six-month period, or you could make it so they have to change it, you know, twice. But maybe it's a longer character set. Um, there's ways to be able to make things easy for the end user, but still maintain uh, security. Authenticity, the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. Be personable. Be a person that, you can, that, you, that other people can come up and ask questions to. Off, be, be willing to ask questions. Um, you know, be able to get out of your comfort zone. And then um, reciprocity, uh, you know, the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. Be open to suggestions from other people. Take lessons and learn from them. Um, it's, it's a great way to kind of build your, build your skills. And so, uh, yeah, in closing, I do have a, a GitHub account, which with a lot of these tools that I had mentioned um, available, the scripts are all available on there. Um, it's, you can find it through my key base. Um, and other than that, if you guys have any other questions, this is kind of wrapped up quickly. <laughs> Anyone? All right. Oh. Can you comment on the, uh, the automation side? Mm -hmm. that's always the was not used in my Yeah. Right? So I saw a sock guy who had figured out what machine does the most often. Like, what makes up the most of it? You know, investigated John Outsourcing. He had him on from outside. So for like half his work, he took a button and it was a real phone. He saw me in that is really awesome. It was pretty VA. So between that and some email rules filtering into to break tickets and set things up, he was able to condense each of the eight hours of work down to about four and spend the four hours doing the things you mentioned with go get the right reaching out and saying better than the what was the repository. Yeah, that's that's an amazing um, you know thought about using the mouse and those automation macro buttons uh, that are available. I, I, I really didn't even think about that as applicable to your job, but that's, that's really great. Um, there was a quote, I'm not sure exactly, it was an efficiency expert in the Industrial Revolution, and um, he would be assigned to a, a particular company, and he would ask, you know, show me the person that gets their job done, but always seems like they got a whole lot of extra time on their hands. The person that, that is, is doesn't look like they're always busy, always has extra time to, uh, you know, for the extra coffee or whatnot, but still does all the jobs that are necessary. And I, I've always kind of thought about that, and it, that, that brings back to the automation, finding the fastest way to get your job done, the way you're supposed to do it. The, you, you've, you've written, you understand from top to bottom. You've scripted it or you've got it uh, handled that you can knock those out. So, yeah. Yeah, Frederick Taylor. I think I couldn't remember the name while I'm standing up here. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for coming out.